Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Food Safety Legislation and Policy Trends webinar. Today, we will be talking about recent changes in laws regarding food safety across the country at both the state and federal level. My name is Laura Wilde, and I'm a Senior Program Analyst in Food Safety for the National Environmental Health Association. I'm joined by my colleague, Taryn Laird, Operations and Communications Specialist. It's our pleasure to facilitate today's webinar. Please note this webinar is being recorded. If you are not okay with it being recorded, you may disconnect at this time. We are pleased you have joined us for our webinar today and hope you take a moment to visit some of our web pages. We work to provide our members at the environmental, in the environmental health community educational tools and resources to support the workforce. Visit our Food Safety Education Month webpage to view several of the policy statements NEHA has created on food safety topics, including food freedom operations, integrated food safety systems, raw milk, food code adoption, cannabis infused food products, and more. You can also check out what some of our partners are offering this month. And of course, don't forget to visit NEHA's food safety website for information on a variety of topics like credentialing, training, collaborations, celebrations, and so much more. We'll go ahead and put the chat, uh, put these links in the chat for your convenience. This free webinar is proudly hosted by the National Environmental Health Association. If you're not already a member, we hope you'll consider joining our vast network of environmental health professionals. We provide opportunities for training and education and have some of the most well-respected credentials in the industry. With our main office in Denver, Colorado and our second office in Washington, DC, we make networking and connections easy. We're a group of over 6,500 environmental health professionals. We hope you'll consider joining us Visit our website at neha.org for more information on membership, education, credentialing, and networking. A bit of housekeeping before we hear from our speaker today. All attendees are in listen-only mode. As a reminder, this webinar is being recorded. Throughout the discussion, you may submit any questions you have in the Q&A box, and we'll do our best to answer as many questions as we can after we hear from our speaker. I am pleased to introduce you to our speaker today. Let's learn a little bit about him before we dive in. Uh, today's speaker is Niha's very own Doug Farquhar. Doug is an attorney with 30 years of experience working with policymakers on environmental and health issues. Primarily working with state legislatures, he has testified 60 times before legislative committees in 36 states, in addition to consulting with state agency staff in every state on enlightening state policymakers. He has written books and articles on state legislative policy and was a columnist for NEHA's Journal of Environmental Health. Doug Farquhar directs government relations for the National Environmental Health Association. Formerly, he was the program director for environmental health at the National Conference of State Legislatures, overseeing the product project and providing, overseeing the project and providing policy outreach to the nation's 7,383 state legislatures and their staffs. During his time at NCSL, he established cooperative agreements from federal counterparts at the U.S. Housing and Urban Development, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, and the U.S. Department of Agriculture. He received a Juris Doctor from the University of Denver, Denver School of Law and his B.A. in Government from the University of Texas, Austin. He is an adjunct professor at the University College at the University of Denver, and is an affiliate professor at the University of Washington School of Public Health. Welcome, Doug, to our presentation today. Thank you so much for being here. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Laura. I appreciate that. Um, if I share my screen, and please give me a thumbs up if you can see that. Excellent. Um, Okay, that sounds, looks like we are ready to go. Um, a few points I want to bring up here um, regarding uh, the, the uh, presentation is that um, when it comes to government affairs, um, we really have it broken down in what's going on in Washington at the federal level, what's going on in the states, and then what are going on in the locals. Um, everybody has a role to play in food safety, which makes, uh, which makes it more challenging and more rewarding 
to address food safety issues. Congress, with their activities, generally the number one thing they do is fund federal agencies. That means for the most part under food safety, it means the funding of FDA and the funding of USDA. Um, FDA, as many know, that funds a majority of our food safety activities at the federal level. USDA funds a majority of the activities regarding meats and uh, 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 products, meat products that fall under their jurisdiction. They both are basically equally funded um, to carry out these activities, uh, even though uh, FDA has a, water, a wider jurisdiction to cover. Um, that does not mean that Congress does not have a role to play in policy regarding, uh, F regarding food safety. Um, they, er, earlier this summer, we had a congressional hearing that FDA attended where Congress uh, questioned their role and their activities regarding food safety. And it really put a spotlight on the agency and how effective it has been. So um, the Congress really also acts as a watchdog as well as a funding mechanism to ensure that the um, to ensure that the agencies are carrying out the missions they have been tasked to do. FDA and USDA's tasks under uh, food safety are enormous. They are expected to make sure that. Every meal in this country, every uh, food, every piece of food product in this country is safe to consume, which is an enormous task to undertake. Uh, Congress, though, does have professionals. Not only is appropriation chair Rosa DeLauro very interested and very uh, concerned about food safety, um, Congressman Rob Whitman is also a former uh, food safety inspector for the state of Virginia. He is the one of the only uh, members of Congress who um, it has earned his REHS credential and uh, is very, very familiar with uh, the food, the parameters of food safety, what needs to be done. He joined us with a, uh, at a tour of a Harris Teeter store in uh, uh, Williamsburg, Virginia uh, on last April. And I was very pleasantly surprised on the level of depth of his knowledge on food safety. He understood the importance of retail, the importance of the supply chain, the importance of getting a product to the market quickly and to be able to get it off the market when it had spoiled. So um, that is a really good uh, uh, set of knowledge to actually have in Congress. So we're very fortunate to have him uh, serve in, uh, in Congress. Um, and, but with that overview, about how this operates, I really want to kind of get into a discussion about what's going on with the uh, uh, with with the states. So, uh, if we can move forward here, you're going to forgive me. It is not moving forward at this point. Laura, I am, <laughs> my apologies, it is not moving forward at this point. Um, can I give slide control over to you? Yeah, let's see what we can do here. Um, Taryn, any magic you can work uh, behind the scenes there? Yes, I'll just go ahead and take over the screen share, Doug. So just go ahead and let me know when you're ready for me to move on to the next slide. Next slide, please. Certainly. And are you still seeing my screen? Um, no, this is just my screen now. Okay. Excellent. I'm, my apologies for that. We had a little bit of a glitch there. Um, but let's talk about what's going on in the states. And the reason I highlight 
state activity so extensively is because that's really where the policy is made. It does not, um, it can em emanate from Congress and it can emanate from the agencies, but primarily the day-to-day -day activity is happening at the state and local level. So when we see states introduce bills, um, that's where we're gonna see the most innovative activity come out, the most um, ambitious activity to come out. Uh, things really do emanate from the states up to the feds and not the other way around. In the 2022, I'm sorry, the 2021, 2022 legislative sessions, um, the reason I couch it that way is um, they states don't all uh, uh, serve in session for the entire time. Um, but during that time period, every state legislature met. And within that, every state introduced some bills regarding food safety. Uh, the ones I tracked, the ones Nihon tracked, were, were 348 different bills regarding food safety. And of those 69 were passed into law. Every state legislature introduced a bill uh, related to food and food safety. And in 38 states, it was those 38 states that enacted the 69 bills we talked about. Therefore, many states did not, 12 states did not to be exact, but uh, 38 states did. And of those states, California and New York were the ones that enacted the most. And as you can see here, certain states are very active. Uh, New York with over 60 bills related to food safety and Minnesota and California, over 45 bills uh, related to food safety. Um, the foremost issue that we saw was retail foods. 53 bills were introduced and three bills passed. Uh, bills related to meat were the second most popular, which of course is not under the FDA jurisdiction, but the USDA jurisdiction, meaning that there were issues there that USDA does not address that the states felt necessary for them to look into. Food freedom bills, and this is I'm including cottage foods, micro enterprise kitchens, any activity where it's calling for the deregulation of food safety oversight, they were the third most popular bills. We saw 45 bills introduced and nine enacted in the states. Um, other popular issues included just general food safety, uh, issues on nutrition where we saw 18 bills introduced and one passed, restaurants and food facilities where we saw 26 introduced and five passed, Food deserts, which uh, I am finding a very fascinating issue because it was um, not on the agenda for legislatures 10 years ago. This year, we saw 30 bills introduced and two passed. And mobile food trucks, six bills were introduced, however, none were passed. Karen, can we have the next slide, please? In retail food, as we can see here, we saw 88 bills introduced and 10 bills were enacted. Several bills were, some of the bills I really wanna highlight here uh, was uh, in Illinois. Illinois enacted Senate Bill 3838, which uh, regards uh, permitting for farmer's markets. One of the options states have come forward with to ensure foods, foods are safe when they are sold at farmer's markets is requiring a uh, permitting uh, permitting operation to go into effect. So the local health departments have the option in the state of Illinois to issue farmers markets retail permits for the sale of products at farmer farmers markets and semi permanent events. Illinois also enacted House Bill 3490, which provides that a restaurant include milk, milk alternative, juice, or water with every children's meals that is sold at, at their restaurant. It, Mississippi also introduced legislation that they enacted, House Bill 1132, which uh, uh, relates to private food service contracts that has been provided for under the Department of Finance and Administration. 
Ohio enacted House Bill 169, which provided, provided grants and money to bars, restaurants, and the lodging industry to ensure their stability during the COVID-19 pandemic. Pennsylvania, they enacted Senate Bill 434, this regarding labeling. It states that the state food protection law uh, has requires that for milk, they must have both a sell-by and a best-by date. If you understand uh, food labeling law, you realize that federal government has a very limited role in labeling. In fact, they only uh, really address nutrition and um, infant formula. Most of the requirements for labeling comes from the states. This is one that Pennsylvania added. Virginia enacted a couple of bills. House Bill 837 requires that any food manufacturer, food storage warehouse, and retail food establishment obtain a permit prior to operating from the Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. This also means that any other permitting requirement that they may have had previously is now uh, void and they are to get all their retail food permitting from the Department of Agriculture. Senate Bill 146 from Virginia also requires on-site certified food protection managers. This bill provides regulations to be adopted by the State Board of Health, not the Department of Agriculture, shall be required to, uh, shall not require an establishment that sells only prepared foods to have a certified uh, food protection manager on site. Uh, a few other bills um, in Wisconsin, they passed Senate Bill 298, which is going to allow dogs at food establishments. And they also enacted HAR 116, which is known as Supermarket Employee Day. Uh, next slide there, Karen. Retail food code. Um, even though we saw several bills introduced, over 40 bills introduced in the states, very few were enacted. And none were all that meaningful with the exception of California. The California uh, bill that was introduced, AB 831, uh, made some substantial changes to the California Retail Food Code, including it allows for limited food per preparation at charitable events. It defines what a retail food requirements are at these charitable events. And it also allowed for mobile food facilities or temporary food facilities to use wood burning ovens when operating, considering they're already outside. Um, it allows for satellite operations, such as guacamole stations, which are very popular in the state of California, to have a food service operation inside food facilities like grocery stores. It uh, authorizes use of double gloving uh, in the industry. And it also requires food facilities that packages potentially hazardous food using cochil or sous vide process to meet the requirements of the FDA food code. It is a very extensive law that addresses many things. One final thing that I'm gonna highlight here is they do add language regarding cottage foods. With in the, uh, op within the cottage food operator, they must include an advertisement that the county of approval that permitted the operation um, has a registration number on there, that, that there is a statement regarding the food, that the food is made in a home kitchen or repackaged in a home kitchen. So they wanna make sure this law ensures that consumers know that the product was made in a home kitchen, not subject to state and food safety oversight. Other bills I highlight here is New York's AB 10607, which establishes a food supply working group. North Carolina House Bill 735 authorizes the Commission of Public Health to adopt rules incorporating the most recent versions of the FDA food code, um, which is a, uh, a carry-on of an extensive effort over the years for North Carolina to adopt the most recent versions of the food code. So they are, for, so the state is always up to date on the on their food code provisions. Um, and New Hampshire, Senate Bill 133 establishes program rules within the Department of Health and Human Services for sanitary production and distribution of food. 
Next slide, please. Food freedom, our favorite issue. Um, I can't tell you on how fast this has really grown from a point where we uh, were, were reacting to very small changes in food laws that gave uh, certain exemptions to um, food operations from uh, food safety oversight to a situation where now every state has some sort of manner where you can sell food that has not been overseen by a, a state inspection service. Um, for this year, we saw 45 bills introduced and nine were enacted into law. This brings us to the point where 32 states have an opportunity to uh, sell uh, homemade food without any sort of state inspection. Um, and of those 25s do not require licensing, permitting, or registration of these home-based food operations. So in half the states out there, you can uh, sell food that has really no oversight whatsoever. On the other hand, we have six states, plus the District of Columbia, that impose in extensive inspection and permitting requirements before anyone can open any time type of homemade food business, no matter if there's a major or minor uh, uh, health risk there. This means that not only potentially hazardous food, but also non-potentially hazardous food must undergo these uh, requirements. Um, also 19 states and the District of Columbia require recipe approval or laboratory testing before selling at least some homemade food product. Um, but even where the state is permissive, as in the 29 st five states that we mentioned, the local ordinance can restrict or outright ban a homemade food business or a cottage food operation if it, uh, if it is legal elsewhere in the state. However, 15 states uh, expressly preempt city and county um, jurisdictions from imposing additional requirements on homemade food or food or cottage food operations. Regarding the bills that were enacted this year, um, a few that to highlight is South Carolina's Senate Bill 506. This one amended their state's home-based food operation law to allow non-potentially hazardous food to be sold directly to retail stores through online sales or mail order uh, operations to directly to consumers. This um, somewhat oversteps their authority because it allows these foods to be sold across state lines, placing that in the jurisdiction of FDA. However, they have put these, um, South Carolina has put this ability into law. So the state of South Carolina cannot enforce cross state sales of these uh, cottage food operations. The bill also provides for labeling to be uh, done, performed by the Department of Health and Environmental Control. And uh, it, it exempts that the requirement of the home address of the producer be placed on there. Maryland also, uh, Maryland adopted House Bill 178 and that changes their cottage food operations from a limit of 25,000 now up to $50,000 a year in sales, and they can still fall under the uh, requirements to sell under a cottage food operation. Um, Utah as well amended their micro enterprise home kitchen law, House Bill 292. Tennessee was very active in this area. They had passed a couple of bills. First one was the Tennessee Food Freedom Act, Senate Bill 693 and House Bill 813 which will allow vendors of homemade food products to sell without permitting or licensing. Its purpose is to recognize the right of individuals to produce, procure, and consume homemade foods of their choice free from unnecessary and anti-competitive regulations and to foster small business innovation and economic growth. They do not take into account in this law the health implications or the health threats 
that these uh, food operations may uh, incur. Um, they really, this law really took it from a point of view that food freedom is inherently safe and that kind of food operations will not pose a problem to the public and therefore it should be allowed. Um, South Dakota uh, passed House Bill 1322. It itself also expanded its food freedom law to allow for the direct sale of certain home produced or home processed foods and food products. Georgia, the legislature enacted the Georgia Raw Dairy Act, House Bill 1175. This bill addresses standards, labeling, and alteration of raw milk to authorize and regulate the production, handling, and transportation, and sale of raw milk and raw milk products for human consumption. The bill, on the other hand, also provides standards for safety, cleansiness, and health of these products, and the animal used to produce them. The bill authorizes the state Commissioner of Agriculture and not the Department of Health to enforce these standards. This bill is of particular interest to um, NEHA because we did provide testimony uh, on this bill to note that um, even though several states do, do allow the sale of raw milk, raw milk, the consumption of raw milk does lead to um, can lead to severe health out, adverse health outcomes, and the state needs to be aware of that as they move forward with this uh, operation, with this law. Um, therefore, we were very pleased with the standards that they added in there for safety, cleansing, and health. Kansas also adopted some bills on raw milk. Uh, Kansas enacted Senate Bill 346, which allows for the uh, sale of raw milk and milk products on farms. The bill authorizes the Secretary of Agriculture to declare an intimate health hazard if you have a situation where an outbreak occurs from an on-farm milk sales, but it does not have specific standards placed, put into place by the legislature regarding safety, cleansiness, and health, as we saw in Georgia. The bill also extends the products, I'm um, sorry, uh, the bill also extends certain milk and dairy license fees and establishes certain standards for milk in the state. New Hampshire um, also expanded their laws regarding uh, the sale of raw milk. In New Hampshire, House Bill 95 allows for the sale of ice cream or frozen yogurt made from raw milk without a milk producer's license. Indiana, they enacted House Bill 1149 that speci specifies a requirement for the preparation and sale of products from a homemade vendor. The bill reorganizes provisions regarding the sale of certain food products by individual vendors at a farmer's market or a roadside stand. And most importantly, it allows for the sale of poultry, rabbits, and eggs at farmer's market or roadside stands if they comply with certain requirements. Um, to follow up with these food freedom laws, uh, we are seeing a, a, a strong emphasis to get these laws passed. In fact, there's a lobbying organization that uh, travels the country working the legislatures trying to encourage um, more and more product get allowed to be sold in, at retail markets or at farmer's markets without state oversight. Um, they are also permitting, uh, trying to expand the, uh, the level of the operation, meaning uh, not putting, removing any limits on the size of the operation that it can be um, uh, uh, any size, any market that they are able to engage in the sale of these products. They are also engaged in removing any labeling requirements that uh, may occur. And they are not limiting themselves to non-potentially hazardous food. We're not talking situations of cupcakes and cookies. We're talking situations of raw vegetables, raw tomatoes, um, uh, salsas, um, uh, also meat products. This, uh, the, the food freedom law in uh, several states now, including um, 
North Dakota, Indiana, and uh, Wyoming, well, you can buy uh, uninspected poultry products in Wyoming. It's up to a thousand. If the if the producer produces a thousand head of poultry, they can sell that without any oversight uh, and directly to consumers. Um, you also have you also see that to expand to other products, including um, um, wildlife that may be um, harvested or um, uh, operations that are um, more localized in nature uh, in scale. Uh, one of the operations that could occur, even though it's not occurring right now in the state of Wyoming, is you could have a situation where they're raising raw oysters in a pond or in an indoor facility of some sort to sell to patrons. That would be able to be done without any uh, sort of state oversight to sell um, even the most hazardous types of products directly to the consumers. Um, the response I have often heard from legislators uh, is that we've had this in place for 10 years and we have not had any sort of um, uh, outbreaks or any sort of problems occur. That of course is because there hasn't been any inspections done. We haven't done any studies. All the studies we have seen regarding foodborne outbreaks coming from the CDC were done a good 10 years ago before these laws went into to place. We do have evidence now though from the Department of Health in Wyoming that a majority, and they're considering a vast majority of their foodborne outbreaks are occurring from food freedom operations. This hasn't allowed them to scale back these operations, but at least now we do have data that shows that food free freedom operations do lead to an increase in foodborne outbreaks. Um, why don't we go on to the next slide there? Thank you. Um, food sovereignty. I often bring this bill up and the state of Maine up where I get uh, most fearful of where I think uh, outbreaks are gonna occur. Maine has been probably even as aggressive, if not more aggressive than the state of Wyoming regarding their food freedom operations. Uh, in the state of Maine, they call it food sovereignty. They couch it in a little bit different manner. They do not uh, put forth to state that this is a, a way for consumers to get the products, but more this is a right that individuals have to produce food in the manner that they feel is best. And this law, um, the way they couch it, does not directly have the state itself preempt locals, but rather allows the locals to go ahead and uh, create any sort of retail sale of food products um, without any sort of state oversight or any sort of state inspections, um, that, the, uh, that if they implement these rules, the state will be um, unable and forbidden from uh, in, enforcing the, their re requirements on these local government entities um, and uh, that they would not be able to uh, preempt any local activities. What this means is that if a fisherman comes in off the, uh, off the sea and wishes to sell raw oysters, um, clams, any shellfish, any seafood, directly from their uh, uh, boat, directly to a consumer, they'll be able to do that. And there's, uh, there, there would be no way for the state to put a stop to that. They have also um, uh, emphasized this and galvanized this in their state constitution. The Food Sovereignty Act, Act is also placed in their state constitution, which is gonna make it extremely difficult for the state to turn around and repeal um, any sort of activity or perform any sort of state oversight of food safety um, in, their, uh, in the state if a local government wants to promote 
a food freedom or a food sovereignty or a cottage food activity. Uh, next slide, please. The reason I tried to highlight uh, food deserts is because I, I found this a particularly interesting issue. This was something that I saw no legislation on back in 2010. In fact, I uh, was uh, working with uh, uh, a certain um, foundation back then, and they were trying to promote the, the issue of food deserts and trying to uh, ask how many states are out there being very active um, to combat food deserts. And as I did my research of state legislation, I found no states had looked into this, no states had passed any bills. In fact, no states had even introduced anything which would look at this issue. So since that time, um, I have noticed I've kept my eye on this, and I've noticed that the um, issue has uh, emerged in many states. In fact, we saw 12 bills on this introduced in 2022. And in fact, four bills, um, well, in fact, five bills, if you want to consider uh, what was done in Maine, were enacted. Um, in Arizona, they passed Senate Bill 1845, which deals with nutrition assistance and uh, allows for an expanded use of their SNAP program to address situations where you have lack of uh, fresh produce or fresh, um, uh, fresh greens in uh, great, you know, large rural areas of the state, even though, and it's part of the irony of it, even though uh, most of our fresh produce does come from, uh, um, uh, from parts of Arizona nearing Yuma uh, area. We also have great areas in the northern part of the states or on the tribal lands where you, it's very, very difficult to get fresh fruits and vegetables. So Arizona sought to address that. Georgia went even further. Georgia Senate Bill 396 is the Georgia State Nutrition Assistant Program is going to be renamed to the Georgia Grown Farm and Food Bank Program. Uh, this bill is going to uh, rename the program. It's going to require food procured pursuant to the program to be Georgia grown. It's also going to require an annual reporting to identify how much of the uh, Georgia grown food is being supplied, uh, which farmers are supplying those foods to the SNAP program. It's also going to authorize persons who provide these services um, to provide it to the Department of Health, to, to allow the Department of Health and other such entities to receive these foods if the food is qualified, if the uh, producer is a qualified recipient. Um, so it's a very proactive effort. It's a very novel effort to encourage the use of and the procurement of locally grown produce. Um, and it's really going to put a strong change to the Georgia SNAP program. Um, this is not the direction that USDA is recommending, but it's the direction that the Georgia legislature sought to go. Um, other food desert issues, Maine. They enacted House, uh, House Bill 503, which supports family farms and seeks to reduce food insecurity, meaning allow um, locals to produce, grow their own food uh, for, their, for the sustainability of their own community. New Jersey Senate Bill 3945 establishes an office of the food insecurity advocate. New York AB 10607 establishes a New York food supply working group to make sure that adequate food is available throughout the state. Next slide, please. Um, Cannabis. We could go on for a long time about cannabis. Uh, where I really want to address um, regarding cannabis is where it affects cannabis in foods. Um, one of the, the, the most important thing for us is that cannabis is not smoked. It is not um, used in uh, oils, it is not used in liquids, it is used as a food product. That's the number one way 
people are getting their uh, cannabis uh, in this country. And uh, therefore, it's cannabis in foods that is going to be the big issue for the states to address in the future. The reason I put forward that the states that are going to have to address it is that FDA um, does not address this issue. This is out of their bailiwick. They're not allowed to it. It's still a, cannabis is still a Schedule I drug. So they are really unable to provide the research, the data, the support that is necessary for state programs to figure out what should be acceptable or not acceptable in their state. Because of that, uh, cannabis and foods have been an active issue within the states. Nine bills were enacted, this bill regarding cannabis, and one deals with food. California Assembly Bill 2155. This um, bill will define the term of cannabis beverages, meaning how much cannabis, edible cannabis, is going to be eligible to be used in a beverage. The Food and Drug Administration. Um, also addresses hemp. They will recognize hemp-derived cannabis ingredients in products if it has a less than a 0.3% dry weight of THC or CBD. If it's in that, they will call it generally recognized as safe, and they will allow the hemp to be used in, um, in those food products. California has probably been the most proactive on this area. It does, it has taken steps um, to allow for CBC, CBD to be approved for use in food and beverage, beverages. They have regulations to that effect. Um, so they have the most comprehensive programs, but that still leaves another 46 uh, states that do not have any, I can't say that are not as proactive as the state of California regarding the sale of cannabis and food. Next slide, please. The reason that uh, we should be concerned about that, and that's reason of concern for the environmental health community is this slide here, meaning in 19 states and in two territories and the District of Columbia, certain amount, small amounts of cannabis is legal for adult recreational use. That means that they are able to use it and sell it within gummies, within candy bars, within brownies, within uh, many food products, which is the most popular way to, to, receive, uh, to receive this uh, product. Um, it means it's gonna be falling in many states under the jurisdiction of the food safety agencies and the environmental health agencies, which is, um, and they're gonna to have to move forward with these regulations without a knowledge of, without any research or data from the federal government, because the federal government has been very reluctant, probably the best way to put it, to get into this area. So therefore, um, the states are very much on their own. Uh, certain states, Colorado and Washington, have been the most, um, has had the most experience with this because they've had their, this situation being able to sell recreational cannabis for the longest. Um, but California, as I said, is probably the most progressive in this area and have the strongest regulatory uh, uh, requirements for the safe sale of, uh, of uh, uh, food cannabis and food products and beverages. We're down to now three states, Idaho, Nebraska, and Kansas, where uh, there's no legal way to purchase uh, cannabis. South Dakota was another holdout state. They changed their mind this year when a citizen's initiative uh, was enacted requiring the sale of uh, cannabis. In a majority of these states, the um, Cannabis has been, recreational cannabis has been adopted via uh, citizens initiative, meaning a petition that's gone around the state legislature. But certain states, uh, it has been done via the state legislature, um, which is um, a, a very you know, rare way for it to do. The vast majority of the states, 
it is done by the uh, by a citizens initiative. That's what occurred in South uh, Dakota. They passed a constitutional amendment A by fifty four percent. It was uh, it's it was uh, challenged in court, but um, um, it still has a certain modifications there that allows certain sales of cannabis in the state. Um, and the interesting thing is in all these states, in the 47 states where you can buy some sort of cannabis, it's still illegal under federal law. It's still a schedule one uh, illegal substance. That's the overview of cannabis in this country. Um, and we're, uh, it's still gonna be a major problem for some years to come. Um, not only because it's going to be difficult to regulate, but that every state has their own uh, direction and their own requirements for regulating these products. For us, the hassle is going to be that it's going to be in foods and beverages. And with that, I'll be very glad to take any questions regarding uh, activities and um, food uh, adoption of food laws in the states and in the federal government career. Thank you, Doug. Wow, there's a lot going on. I feel like we could have this webinar every six months or so and give people new information each time. Hi. Well, great. At this time, uh, we'll open it up for questions. Uh, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A box and let's, uh, let's get to it. So the first question we have, Doug, is from Stephanie. Um, she's uh, curious about... Um, the Pennsylvania bill, uh, early on in your slides, you talked about the Pennsylvania bill that was introduced. So her question is, curious if the use by slash best by date for milk in Pennsylvania bill was spearheaded by food safety experts or by legislators? Well, um, I'm not, I'm gonna say neither. It was probably spearheaded by a certain lobbying organization uh, that are out there, which means uh, you don't know, I don't know which interest really pushed it. I don't think the dairy lobby was the one that pushed it. Um, the dairy lobby has been very proactive in many, uh, any issue dealing with dairy, especially raw milk. This one generally comes from consumer safety groups. So that's where I'm assuming that the legislature got the prompt to go ahead and enact this bill. Got it. Thanks. And speaking of lobbying groups, is there a particular entity or entities um, or a lobbying group that is pushing this food freedom movement that's been seen nationwide? That's yes. from James. <laughs> oh. The short answer is yes. The second short answer is extremely well funded. Um, and hopefully this is not going to be a problem, but it's known as the Institute for Justice. They are a libertarian think tank that is supported by the Koch brothers. So that's the reason they have uh, funding available to send lobbyists out into these states and to get these activities um, adopted by, uh, by state legislatures. All right, let's um, stay on point with food freedom for a moment. Question from Justin. Even with the concerns of food freedom, are there any states that are doing it the right way um, that other states could look at? Do you know anything about that, Doug? Well, certain states do things, um, I, I, I would have to say very intelligently. Um, with Wyoming and North Dakota and with Maine, these blanket exemptions are just not healthy. They're not a, a good approach to take because it just exempts everything. On the other hand, Texas um, surprisingly has been very smart about th their food freedom efforts in the sense that when they, the first bill they passed was known as the cupcake bill. And the bottom line was this was a non-hazardous product. And so the legislator said, well, we won't exempt it, but if the um, producer takes food safety lessons. They learn how to prepare these products safely by the Department of Health or the Department of Agriculture, then we're gonna give them an affirmative defense in case uh, a foodborne outbreak does occur and it's linked back to them. They can at least go to the judge and say, 
I was trained and it gave them some protection. Um, they are also have some bills recently, and I mean these past few legislative sections, sessions that puts more um, oversight regarding farmers markets. Much of this activity regarding food freedom is all stems from the explosion of farmers markets in this country. Beforehand, you had to go to a retail store and there were certain protections in place before they could sell the product in the, uh, out on their shelves. Farmers markets don't have those protections. And by um, codifying those lack of protections at farmers markets, it ex spreads it. Texas did take a look at that and say, we want to make sure, we don't wanna to have to close down these farmers markets. So let's make sure that we have protections in place that makes sure that you can still, st still sell your product, but let's be smart about it. Um, another state I'd like to highlight would be Michigan. Michigan uh, worked with their Department of Health to say, look, we're going to allow certain foods to be sold without state oversight. Work with us on how's the best way for us to do that. And even though the department was not happy about allowing this to occur, it, they were able to get some protections in there that help limit and scale back any sort of foodborne outbreaks that may occur. Thank you, Doug. Let's, um, let's find another question here. Um, lots of questions on food freedom and uh, home operations. So um, here's a question from Vince specifically about homemade food. Would zoning or home insurance laws prevent homemade food businesses from operating? You know, this is one of the things I've been curious about myself, which is if you're selling something out of your house, what is your insurance company going to do? What do they think about it? And um, even, you know, any of these requirements I have seen regarding home-based operation, I don't see anything in there saying, the insurance company must cover this activity. My assumption, because insurance companies are extremely intelligent and they know they're very effective in not paying out anything, that they have figured out some way uh, to work with their state insurance commissioners to say, we don't cover these types of operations. Um, I don't have that down for a fact. That is a research project I would love some graduate student to delve into. Um, because I, when I've looked at this regarding other environmental threats, I have seen the insurance industry be very, very aggressive in making sure that they are exempt from any sort of potential hazards that, that uh, could occur and could, you know, in, could lead to an incursion of them having to pay out. So, um, and that is something I really am expecting uh, that would be a real major issue if we really looked into it, because um, if they're, you know, if you're selling this product, there's no state oversight, kids get sick, which we know they do, the only person you can go back on is the home producer. And as you know, um, that, would pro that would easily bankrupt any individual who's trying to do, produce something out of their house. That was a very good question. Thank you. Uh, we have another question from Emily, kind of in the same vein here. It might be a little bit outside of the scope, but we're food safety professionals here, at least I am. So let's see if we can't answer this next question. Um, the question is, can you share some more information about the link between an increase in foodborne illnesses and food freedom laws? Has that data been published? Um, Yes, no, it has not been published in a manner that I think you would hope for, meaning something in some sort of formal publication that I have not seen. This is um, mostly anecdotal evidence that we received from the Casper newspaper. Um, Casper, Wyoming reached out to the Department of Health and uh, in a discussion regarding food freedom and the Department of Health said, this is where we're finding our problems. Um, this is where the issue is, is in food freedom operations. 
but I wasn't, we haven't seen that article go into any sort of research, um, which is desperately needed, but um, we haven't seen CDC update their food safety research data. And the state of Wyoming has had very, you know, the state of Wyoming is very limited to start with. So uh, the ability for them to go out and the Department of Health to go out and do a formal survey and study uh, is just cost prohibitive of the state right now. However, they've had it around the longest and they've had the most proactive uh, efforts. So when the Department of Health says that's where it's coming from, I think it's something that we can really hang our hat on and would really um, really warrant a further exploration by some university or some uh, foundation. Mm -hmm. and, and I imagine in the, in the areas that don't require permitting or inspection, uh, you know, if there are illnesses that are occurring, it might be very difficult to trace them back. So um, I'm certainly, I would love to see more research on that as well. Raw uh, milk, like we, we do have, we do have research regarding raw milk and we have had that come forward where we have explored the more liberal and more lenient raw laws allowing for the sale of raw milk and the increase of, of outbreaks related to the milk product. Well, Doug, I think we have one more uh, time for one more question and then I'll do a little outro to close us out. But the, the last question I have on my screen is, um, how much impact do lobbyist organizations have in food desert and cannabis legislation? Um, well, they have um, the same impact I think they have with anyone else, depending on if they can get a legislator's ear, if they can convince them and start moving forward. Uh, like I said, when I first started looking at this uh, issue, it was very hard for me to convey this and discuss this with legislators because many legislators on ag committees, which is where all the food safety stuff goes, are farmers and they're kind of like, well, what do you mean the problem is nobody has access to adequate and healthy food within a four or five mile limit? It takes me four miles to drive off my ranch. What do you mean? You know, I don't have any access. So it, it's really been a paradigm shift in legislative points of view. And uh, where I've seen this happen, where I'm really kind of encouraged by it, is we saw a lot of bills in Missouri. We saw a lot of, we've seen bills in the Midwest. We saw bills, this is a, these are bills that are responding to a problem in rural areas, which is, where many of these legislators are from on these ag committees versus what we're seeing in New Jersey and New York, where the problem is really couched in terms of the inner city um, and communities such as that. So there are problems in both areas. You just have to couch it entirely differently. The fact that you don't have fresh fruits or vegetables in a six square mile part of an inner city or a 600 square mile part of a tribal reservation, the problem's still the same. It's just how you answer it is gonna be different. Thank you, Doug. And um, I'll take this a moment to, to thank you again for this, this presentation. There's so much out there. I feel like we could go on and on. Um, so thank you, this was really valuable. We hope to do some more things like this. Um, so thank you all for attending today at our National Food Safety Education Month webinar. A special thank you to Doug and the people behind the scenes like Taryn that make webinars like this happen. Uh, thanks for your time and attention today. I hope you're all well. Uh, stay well and we'll, we'll see you on the next webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Laura.